Turn in your Bibles to the book of Genesis. Genesis. Everybody likes a party. There, there's a party that is going on in Joseph's house. We left you there the last time, if you remember. Uh, Joseph, second in command of all of Egypt, is at the head table. There is the Egyptian table, probably guests and maybe even some servants there. But then in the third table is all of Joseph's brothers. And from the oldest, you remember, down to the youngest, with Benjamin at the end, given five times the portion, the amount of food, uh, that all of his other brothers had, and we said that was for a reason. That'll come back up again. All of them are happying. We left you last week, or happy and partying and having a great time. It's almost as if the great offense of them selling Joseph into Egypt didn't ever happen, and that's where we left you last time where the story ended. But now for the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey would say, uh, except we're not coming to the end of this story. Can you imagine how long that the story of Joseph has carried on in the scriptures? It has been seven chapters, let me say this, so far. Let's have a word of prayer, and I'd like to preach you the message entitled, When God Works Repentance. When God Works Repentance. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for those that have found it good to come and to hear the word of God this morning. I pray, Lord, that we would not just go through the motions. Let this word that we are seeing in this chapter uh, really come up out of the text. Lord, I've tried to study to show myself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Help me to rightly divide the word of truth. Lord, there are folks in this room, including myself, that need this sermon, that need uh, what is going on in the heart of the brothers, what you're doing. And so, Lord, I ask that you would work in a great way. Lord, we give you all of our hearts. We give you this moment, these few moments that we can hear from your word. In Jesus' precious name, and all God's people said, amen. So let's go, please, to Genesis 43. We'll look at the last verse of 43, and then over to 44. Genesis 43, and then we'll read chapter 44. And again, this is a long reading, so I'm going to let you be seated one more Sunday. So you notice, please, at the end of chapter 43, the verse, the verse 34 says, And he took and sent messes or portions unto them, that's talking about food, from before him, that's Joseph did from his table. Benjamin's mess was five times so much as any of theirs, and they drank and were merry with him. So that's where the party ended. Now let's go on to 44. Here we go. And he commanded the steward of his house, saying, Fill, this is Joseph, fill the men's sacks with food, as much as they can carry, and put every man's money in his sack's mouth, and, and put my cup, the silver cup, in the sack's mouth of the youngest, and his corn money. You remember corn uh, is better translated grain. It's talking about grain. And he did according to the word that Joseph had spoken. As soon as the morning was light, the men were sent away, they and their asses, and when they, had, they were gone out of the city, and yet not, or not yet far away, Joseph said unto his steward, Up, follow after the men, and when thou dost overtake them, say unto them, Wherefore have ye rewarded evil for good? Is not this it in which my Lord drinketh, and whereby indeed he divineth? Don't worry about that word, we'll hit it later. Ye have done evil in so doing. And he overtook them, and he spake unto them these same words. And they said unto him, Wherefore saith my Lord these words? God forbid that thy servants should do according to the, this thing. Behold the money which we found in our sack's mouth. We brought again unto thee out of the land of Canaan. How then should we steal uh, out of my Lord's house silver and gold? With, with whomsoever of thy servants it be found, both let him die, and we also will be my Lord's bondmen. Look up here a moment. Uh, this is a, we're not going to preach any sermon on this, but those of you who have been with us all this story, the, if these guys are nothing, they are good at making rash vi vows. 
They do it in almost every chapter. Well, let him die. Let him die. If this isn't right, let him die. You know, and here again, you know, before they can find out the end of the story, they make rash vows. So I don't know if the Lord wants to deal with your heart about that here this morning or whatever. But if you're a guy who makes rash vows, stop it. Okay, here we go. Verse number 10. And he said, Now also let it be according to, unto your words. He with whom it is found shall be my servant, and ye shall be blameless. So in verse 10, the steward changes their words a little bit and says, No, whoever is the cup is found, he'll be my servant, and, you'll, and the rest of you will be blameless. Then they speedily took down every man's sack to the ground and opened every man's sack, and he searched and began at the eldest and left, left at the youngest, and the cup was found in Benjamin's sack, the youngest. Then they rent their clothes and laid at every man uh, his ass and returned to the city. And Judah and his brethren came to Joseph's house, for he was yet there. And they fell before him on the ground. And Joseph said unto them, What deed is this that ye have done? What, not, what ye not that such a man as I can certainly divine? Same word as divination earlier. And, and Judah said, what shall we say unto my Lord? What shall we speak? Or how shall we clear ourselves? God hath found out the iniquity of thy servants. Behold, we are thy Lord's servants, both we and, and he also with whom the cup is found. And he said, God forbid that I should do so. But the, the man in whose hand the cup is found, he shall be my servant. So he changes their words too. And as for you, get you up in peace unto your father. Then Judah came near unto him and said, O oh my Lord, let thy servant, I pray thee, speak a word in my Lord's ear, and let not thine anger burn against thy servant, for thou art even as Pharaoh. My Lord asked his servant, saying, Have you a father or a brother? And, and we said unto my Lord, this was, by the way, folks, this is previous chapters. This is when they first met. We have a father, an old man, and a, a child of his old age, a little one, and his, his brother, is dead, and he, he alone is left of his mother, and his father loveth him. And thou sayest unto thy servants, Bring him down unto me, and I, that I may set mine eyes upon him. And we said unto my Lord, The lad cannot leave his father, for if he should leave his father, his father would die. And thou sayest unto thy servants, Except your youngest brother come down with you, ye shall see my face no more. And it came to pass, when we came un, up unto thy servant, my father, uh, we told him the words of my Lord, and our father said, Go again and buy us a little food. And we said, We cannot go down. If our youngest brother be not with us, then will we go down, for we may not see this man's face, except our youngest brother be with us. And thy servant, my father, said unto us, Ye know that my wife bare me two sons, and the one went out from me. And I said, Surely uh, he is torn in pieces, and I saw him not since. That's Joseph. And if... Ye take this also from me, and mischief fall, befall him. Uh, ye shall bring down my gray heads with sorrow to the grave. Now, th now therefore, when I come to thy, ser thy servant, my father, and the lad uh, be not with us, seeing that his life is bound up in the, in the lad's life, it, it shall come to pass when he seeth that the lad is not with us, that he will die. And thy servants shall bring down the gray hairs, hairs of thy servant our father with sorrow to the grave. For thy servant became surety for the lad uh, unto my father, saying, If I bring him not unto thee, then I shall bear the blame to my father forever. Now therefore I pray thee, let thy servant abide instead of the, land, the lad a bondman to my lord, and let the lad go up with his brethren. For how shall I go up to my father, and the lad be not with me, lest peradventure I see the evil that shall come upon my father? And I want to just read a little of verse number one so you get what's going to happen next time. Then Joseph could not refrain himself before all of them that stood by him and cried, cause every man to go from me, and there stood no man with him, while Joseph made himself known unto his brethren. Amazingly, this story has gone on for seven chapters, greater, I believe, than any other story probably in the Bible, uh, definitely in Genesis. But it's not over yet. It is good for us 
And there's a reason that God has allowed this slow progression. So you can look at this as you're reading through devotions, maybe through Genesis, and you, you can say, um, did God allow it to go so long because God is a slow storyteller? Okay, no, that's not why it's going so slow. It's good for us to see this slow progression and understanding that time is necessary in what God is doing in Joseph's heart as far as mercy and forgiveness, but then especially for what God is doing in his brother's heart to bring guilt, shame, conviction, fear, and pain in order for God's purpose to bring them to repentance. And this is how we're going to start, and this is how we're going to end with this chapter. God often uses this process of time to change our hearts. Him doing something by his pressure and by his pain in your life to bring you in certain areas to repentance. The party is over, and the next day the brothers are going to leave. God, through Joseph, had tested their selfishness and jealousy in the greater uh, portions of food being given to Benjamin, what he had received. You remember that's kind of how the, the last chapter ended. And uh, we said when we talked about that, that how would they react? Benjamin's getting this five times portion. How would the other brothers react? Well, you remember when Joseph had a coat of many colors, they were extremely jealous and that led to them wanting to kill him. Okay, so how would they would react when he, you know, just their youngest brother got, you know, five times a portion. It was all good. It was great. There, there was some kind of change there. You know, there was, they were partying. They had great, you know, fun with Benjamin, with Joseph, or whatever. But this was one great more test, or one more great test that God was bringing through Joseph in these brothers' life. Follow me. Joseph tells his faithful henchman, we've talked about this steward being in on it, I think. He tells him, fill the sacks with grain, put their money back in the sacks again, but this time, put my special silver cup in the sack of the youngest, Benjamin. Can you see the silver cup in my hand? Can you? How good is your imagination this morning? He said, put that cup, this cup that was on my table, this must have been a very notable t cup. I don't know if it was like studded with diamonds or whatever, but it, they talk about it as if it was kind of a tool, almost a scepter in the hand of a king. This was something very special that was notable that when they were having the party in there, evidently Joseph was using or something, something that was very notable. Now, what is Joseph, or rather God, doing by putting this sack into the youngest, you know, grain? And what is the point? Well, returning their money is another act of kindness. He had done this before for his family. And we kind of said that that, you know, they were going through a famine, and Joseph was trying to help his brothers. So they didn't want them to starve, you know. So it was kind of putting it back, the money putting back, you know, was kind of an act of kindness. And you remember he told his steward, his steward said that God had done that for you. And in the rest of the story, we never hear anything about the money again. But what about this cup? Notice in the reading, folks, look down at your page again, that the steward and then Joseph strategically makes the drama about what would happen to Benjamin. So when he put the cup in the sack, it wasn't just that the cup went, went, went in one of the boys or one of the, the brothers' sack. It specifically went in Benjamin's sack, the youngest. They direct, and from that point on, they direct all the fault towards Benjamin. In verse number 2, in verse number 12, and in verse number 17, Joseph and the steward together are, doing, are working a strategy. Joseph and the steward are bringing the test to blame Benjamin, so that he alone will be held responsible. Now why? Why did they want to get all the attention on Benjamin, and, and it looked like you know, he was going to be put to death, and then it looked like he was going to be taken as a slave? Why? Joseph wants to see the reaction of the brothers when they think Benjamin is going to be taken as a slave. Again, it's about what has changed in these brothers' hearts. He wants to see their reaction. That would reveal if their heart had changed in their selfishness and in their abuse and in their hatred and their willingness to hurt others. Okay, let that just kind of gel with you a moment. This is the test. So when it would come down to it that Benjamin got all the blame and he was going to be taken as a slave, how would these guys react? Would they be fine? Would they allow Benjamin to be taken? 
Joseph lets the brothers get just out of the city gates, and then he sends the steward and guards after them. Joseph tells the steward to go after the men, and, uh, and when you catch them in verse number four, it says, you ask them, why have you, re- why have you rewarded evil for good? The good being that, you remember, he had shown a lot of kindness to them in the last sermon, in the last chapter. And it ended with this great po- party. Why would you do this? Why would you reward my good with your evil? Some of you know the end of the story. You remember that Joseph is eventually going to say to them about the whole matter, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. I think this statement of when the steward catches up with them, I think that Joseph is making a point, a point that he wants them to think about. Joseph may have asked this question to prick his brother's heart because in his boyhood, they had returned his boyhood good for evil. And I'm sure that when someone does something to you, you know, that pain of what they have done, when you think that you have done good, it's just hard to go away. This still may have been in Joseph's mind. Joseph also makes this point about divining. Would you like to know about this whole divining thing? That was what, when I f- was first studying the passage, that was stuck in, stuck in my mind. You know, the silver cup helps, me to, helps him divine, the steward says. And then, and then in verse number 15, he says, don't you know that such a guy as, as me can divine? Great, what is divining? Well, this is also part of Joseph's ruse. You remember that word? Ruse. Okay, not rouge, ruse, all right? He had become very powerful and famous in Egypt for what reason? That he could interpret dreams. He was like a magician. He's like, da 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 I know what everything is going on. He'd become powerful and famous for interpreting dreams, and Joseph used that fame that the brothers knew, along with another thing that, that, it, that Egypt was famous for, and it was spiritism. And Egypt was famous for the spiritism of divin- divination. And Joseph used both of these things in his rouge. Let me tell you about what divination is, okay? Here's the pulpit commentary. Uh, it says, the special form of divination here in this passage referred to, okay, I'm going to give you the name of it, kulikamantaya, now you know it, or divining out of cups, the silver cup, was practiced by the ancient Egyptians. Small pieces of gold or silver, together with the precious stones, marked with strange figures and signs, were thrown into the vessel, after which certain incantations were pronounced, and the evil demon was evoked, invoked, sorry, the latter was then supposed to give the answer either by intelligible words, this de- the demon out of the cup, or by pointing to some of the characters on the precious stones or in some other more mysterious manner. Okay, this isn't superstition. Demons are no joke, okay? I'm not going to spend a bunch of time talking to demons about demons. I'm going to tell you stay away from them, all right? They're fallen angels. They're real. They have power. God's going to judge them, all right? The Bible says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Part of what we, f- we wrestle with are, are demons. I'm not going to talk about that, but evidently in ancient Egypt, this was part of the whole, you know, mag- magical, you know, demon, all this kind of worship, spiritism. Joseph's power and guidance did not come from demons. This was part of his ruse to scare the tar out of his brothers. His power, we've known from all the beginning, and it's been stated over and over by him himself, came from God Almighty, not demon divination. But his brothers didn't know that. And so he used this ruse to make them think that he knew everything. Don't you know a man such as I could look in the cup and the demon comes out and tells me that Benjamin has stolen, this, stolen my silver cup? You know, don't you know that I have the power of divination? And of course they were shaking in their boots at that point. Well, it all plays out just like Joseph planned. And the brothers are shocked in verse number 7. They say when they're accused, why would you say these things? God, God forbid that we would do that. And then they remind the steward, this is when the steward first got to them, making the accusation. They reminded the steward that they were the ones who had brought back the money that they found in their sacks from Canaan. It's a great point. Why would we, why would we steal silver and gold from you now when we had done that earlier, when we, we had returned our money? It's a great point, but it's not part of the strategy, so the steward just ignores that. But then they go too far, as we see in verse 9 and 10. Let's read that portion. 44, 9, and 10. With whomsoever of thy servants it shall be found, both let him die, and we also shall be my Lord's bondmen, or slaves. 
And he said, now also let it be according to your words. But then he changes the deal. He with whom it is found shall be my servant, and ye shall be blameless. These boys are always jumping to the nth degree, making these rash vows. Let him die where the cup is found. Let him die, and the rest of us will be your slaves. But notice how the, the steward manipulates their words again, against them to accomplish what he and Joseph are trying to accomplish, and that is to bring all the guilt on Benjamin. He says, no, 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 no. Like, like you've said, you know, you're in trouble, but wherever we find the cup, you know, that guy will be made a slave, and the rest of you will be blameless. This is very important. This is not just a little thing. This is important. The sacks are searched from the eldest to the youngest. It's almost like a movie playing out, you know, when they play this long scene, and they hear the music in the background, and the long scene builds up, you know, this intensity, where's the cup going to be found, whatever. He starts the th with a great theatrical value from the oldest to the youngest. Of course, he put the, he put the cup in the youngest. He knows where it is. But he goes from, the, and they're all like, oh, oh, and then one of them's thinking, okay, it's been five guys, you know, maybe, maybe they're just not, you know, not the cheeseburgers, the five guys, the brothers, okay. It, maybe you're not going to find the cup, we're going to be all scot-free, whether well, sweating, they're sweating through the entire ordeal until the climax of finding the cup in Benjamin's bag. Nothing even said about their money that, they found, that was found in their sacks. All of this, folks, on purpose to increase the pressure on the brothers to bring it to Benjamin. Can you imagine the outcry in verse number 13 as the steward fishes around in the grain and voila you boys are in trouble and the bible says that they they rip their clothes their you know they rip their clothes which through the bible is a statement i'm sure in some cultures you do this still when you're just aghast at what is going on they rip their clothes in horror now i want you to notice just a hint that may indicate a change in these brothers because remember we're talking about repentance what what may indicate that their hearts have changed from way long time ago now when they sold their brother into slavery we'll verify later that this is a valid hint the steward had clarified that only the brother who had the cup would be taken as slave right say right 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 and the rest would be blameless right Except when they find the cup, it it, the Bible says they get up all on their donkeys and they go back to the city. It seems like they're willingly going on their own volition to appeal about the state of Benjamin to Joseph. Something is changing here about the brothers. You know, and you know, I hope this isn't an overstretch, but the steward had said that everyone else would be blameless and they, they should be able to go free. But you see the brothers going back to Egypt. And what they do immediately is fall down and appeal before Joseph. They cared about the fate of Benjamin. And they were not going to abandon him. They arrive back at Joseph's house. They fall before him to the ground in great humility. Totally at his mercy. Totally helpless to defend themselves. You can hear it coming out in the verbiage. Joseph, Joseph tears into them, continuing the test. What have you done? Uh, don't you know such as man as I can divine? It wasn't exactly like that. You remember, he's, he's still speaking through an interpreter. So he's going, and he's saying, what are you saying in Hebrew? Is da, da, da. So it gets to them like, I mean, this is a law, this is a, uh, this is a drama. Joseph speaks up, or excuse me, Judah speaks up, one of the brothers. What can we say? What shall we speak? How can we clear ourselves? Now look at this in verse number 16. God hath, this is Judah speaking, one of the brothers, he's speaking for the rest of the brothers. God hath found out the iniquity of thy servants. God has found out the iniquity of our servants. The ESV translates this, the guilt of thy servants. God has found out the guilt of thy servants. What guilt is this speaking of? I, is it the guilt of the cup? Is it the immediate guilt? No, they weren't confessing to that. That is not what Joseph is referring to. That is not iniquity. That wasn't guilt. They didn't do it. He is referring to the same guilt that he talked about in front of Joseph way back in chapter 42 and verse 22 when they didn't think he understood their Hebrew language. And they were talking amongst themselves and they didn't know that Joseph understood. And you remember it affected him, it affected him great emotionally. And this is what they said back in 42. And they said one to another, we are very, here it is, guilty. 
concerning our brother in that we saw the anguish of his soul when he besought us and we would not hear therefore is this distress come upon us God had been working in these guys hearts with all this pressure and this back and forth from Canaan and all the stuff that was coming from Joseph and you know being in prison and then ke- them keeping Simeon and all this stuff that had happened and they, when they appeal now here, here in this present story, in this present chapter, when they see that he's going to take Benjamin, it just comes out of them. You know, God is dealing with our iniquity. He's dealing with our guilt of what we've done by selling Joseph way back in the past. I want us to see this morning that this guilt has been on the brother's mind in the past through all these chapters, but it was not yet repentance. There was the feeling of wrong and even the verbalization and confession of wrong. They've said that that they were wrong, but no heart change and thus no true repentance. And folks, that is often true about our own sin. That we can say we're wrong. We can even feel guilty about what we have done. But that is not repentance. That is not full repentance that's not I should say genuine repentance you can say those things and you can feel those things and your heart not change just like this story Judah appeals to Joseph sort of submitting to their fate we are your slaves and the man that's Benjamin in whose hand the cup is found we're all your slaves folks that even that part shows change in his heart you know, they, he knew that they were going to be allowed to go free, but he's, he's, when he appeals and they see that he sees that they're going to keep, you know, Benjamin, he says, listen, we're, I give up, we're all your slaves. But notice that Joseph, again, steers the grammar, steers the conversation, steers the test only to directly deal, put all the blame on Benjamin and all the responsibility. Let's, let's read verse 17. It says, And he said, God forbid, Joseph talking back to them, he said, we're all your servants, verse 16. In verse 17, and he said, God forbid that I should do so, that I should take you all as my slaves. But the man, and it's funny, look up here, right? So he is saying, okay, this supposedly Egyptian prince, Joseph, is saying, Elohim forbid. Or or you can think of it, he's saying, your Hebrew God forbid that I should take you all as servants. That wouldn't be just, that wouldn't be fair because you didn't didn't all steal the cup. But the man in whose hand the cup is found, he shall be my servant. And as for you, get you up in peace. You know, I send you away in peace. Go to your father. Elohim forbid I should enslave you all. I'll just make Benjamin my slave. Take care, Godspeed, have a good trip, go back to your father. Here is the moment of the test. The big test. How would they react? Would they give Benjamin up and be happy to save their own skin or what? Would they think of their father's sorrow at all? Well, I want you to notice I read through verse number 18 through verse number 34 of how Judah, I'm going to just start reading 18. It's in a very, very, very long uh, passage. So, but let me, actually, let me just read about 32 through 34. Let me read it. For thy servant became surety for the lad unto my father saying if i bring him not unto thee then shall i bear the blame to my father forever and therefore i pray thee let thy servant abide instead of the lad a bondman to my lord and let the lad go up from his brethren and then look at verse the end of verse number 31 up a little bit higher Um, it talks about uh, the gray hairs of thy servant our father with sorrow to the grave Verse 30, up up the end of it, his life is bound up in the lad's life. You know, verse 29, hairs with sorrow to the grave. You know, it talks about even in verse 28, surely he is torn in pieces, talking about his father, the father's memory of Joseph, of what happened to Joseph. What's going on here? In all of these verses, when Judah is making this last appeal, You see real change that has occurred over time in these brothers. And I want to point it out to you so you see it. So you can see how repentance really moves, it really comes or really is the definition, a change of heart. So in verse number 20, if you look there, you see these boys, something 
that they didn't have in their childhood, for sure, compassion for their father. In the end of verse number 20, acceptance of the special love between their father and Benjamin, the son of Rachel. Remember, that favoritism was what made him so mad at Joseph. Um, you see in verse 22, realization of the harm of the sorrow of, to their father, what this was going to do to their dad. In verse 28, you see their heart changing, an understanding of what the loss of Joseph had done to their father years ago when he thought that Joseph was torn into pieces. In verse 29, you see their change of mind and change of heart, compassion toward the end of their father's life, being a premature death and sorrow to the grave if Benjamin doesn't come home. In verse 34, you see their change of heart, fear of what losing another son would do to their father, kill him. And perhaps the most significant heart change that we can see here coming out of them is in verse number 33, when Judah says, when Judah says, let me switch places with Benjamin. Let me be your servant instead of the lad. That's a lot different than Let's kill Joseph. Let's throw him in a pit and come back and kill him later. Look, there is a caravan. Maybe we can sell this kid and he'll be out of our hair. There is a heart change. It's a lot different than take his coat, rip it, put on some animal blood, take it back to dad, and it will be our cover for he got killed by a wild animal as the, the dad is weeping and the brothers are just covering themselves and they don't care at all about what's going on with the father. What I'm pointing out to you folks is that over this process of time, seven chapters and many years and what God had done through all the pressure in their life, God had changed their heart. He had brought them to true repentance, a change, a difference. I think it is significant here that Judah does not just... He doesn't, doesn't just speak for the other brothers. It's not a general statement that he says, like, we'll all be your slaves. Something's changed now, even here in, in, the, in this chapter. It's not we will all be your slaves. It's specifically, I will be your slave. I will change places with Benjamin. Let me be your slave. It's specific. It's sacrificial. It is serious. He is genuinely willing to, split, to switch places with Benjamin. And this change of Judah's heart is, I think, typical of what has gone on in all the brothers. I don't know. I don't know, even using the term, like, full repentance. You know, Scripture doesn't use that term. You know, I, I don't know if this is perfect, complete repentance. For instance, you don't hear them saying, when, he, when Judah is talking to Joseph, our father thinks Joseph was ripped apart, but we really sold him. Okay, so it wasn't full disclosure. Of course, he really didn't need to confess to this Egyptian prince anyhow. I don't know. But what we can say is it is genuine repentance. There is genuinely a change of heart here. And true behavioral change. And Joseph recognizes it. And God recognizes it. And he gives Joseph the green light to something he's never had uh, before in the story. He's given him the green light to tell his brothers who he is, and to be restored to his brothers. We'll see that next week. What we have experienced, folks, over seven chapters through all these weeks is the process God uses to bring a person to repentance. It's not always like that. Sometimes God just knocks you off your donkey. He just takes your legs out from under you, and there's this massive pain where he brings you face to face with the mirror of how wretched your depravity is in a certain situation and you change but but most often maybe or most of the time God brings your heart to repentance by a series of pressures or convictions or maybe even confrontations or things that are going on to change your the thinking of your heart little by little to not be the person that you were before, changing you. Genuine repentance. There's a heart change, a behavior change. I believe that that is true whether you're talking about repentance that brings salvation or whether it's talking about 
God dealing with particular areas of his own children, children who have already been born again, who have trusted Jesus as their Savior, and God is still working repentance in specific areas of their life, about sin areas of our life, about things that are not like Jesus Christ. You can call it sanctification. You can talk, call it growth. You can call it what you want. But God is changing your mind and your heart towards an area you are living out this certain way to bring you to genuine repentance. Please notice some biblical truths about repentance from our story. Number one, the longevity of the tests is part of God bringing you to repentance, maturity, and victory in different areas. Okay, the longevity is important to God. He uses the longevity to truly change your heart. We have seen all these tests and pressures and situations that worked on the brother's heart. Well, God uses this process of pressure in your life also to change you and to bring you to, to change of mind and change of heart and change of behavior in different areas. James 1, 2 through 4 kind of talks about a process, this process, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. That's the word that is used, translated trials or temptations in the New Testament. Knowing that, it, in, and I would just put a header on that, pressures of life. You know, be happy when you are experiencing pressures of life. Knowing this, verse 3, that the trying of your faith worketh patience, but let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. And then the, it goes on. It's a, it, God is saying in this passage, there's something lacking in you. And I'm going to address it with trials and, and pressures in your life that's going to hurt and bring pain. And, and you might be confused and you might want to get out of it qu quickly. No, 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 no. It might take me seven chapters in your life to work out repentance. But there is something that is wanting in you in the verse. There's something that is lacking in you. And I am going to deal with it until your heart thinks differently in that area and until I work that virtue in you that needs to be worked in Christ's likeness. God is a master at this. He's an incredible surgeon, a spiritual surgeon of our hearts. To me, it's always, it always blows my mind that when he gave us Jesus Christ, the gospel, we trust on him as Savior. It's not, and I say this all the time, hear it again. It's not just a ticket to heaven. He continues to work on us until the day that we see Jesus face to face and we'll be like him because we'll see him as he is. Until that time, he's not just saying, hey, hold, hold on to your ticket. No, he is saying, I'm going to change you to be like Jesus Christ until that day you see him eye to eye, face to face, and you, imagine, you immediately and supernaturally become glorified and like him. But until that day, I'm going to work on your heart. And it might hurt and it might take a while. It might take seven chapters in your life to work out something specific that I'm trying to work out in your heart. As I said, we can think of this as sanctification or growth or whatever, but the trials and pressures of our lives is God's confronting actual sin issues in us that are not like Jesus and that need to change. He is confronting, convicting, chiseling, illuminating your heart to change. And most of the time, you don't even realize it. Yet he's, not, he's not concerned. Um, okay, it, it's kind of like this. Let me pause and go over here. It's kind of like this. You're at Christiana Hospital and, and you're going through surgery. And, uh, you know, he, the, the anesthesiologist has come in uh, and, and put you out, whatever. And so they're working on you. It's a big surgery. He's working on you. He's working on you. Say, hey, hey, wake him up. Wake him up. What? You're in the middle of the surgery. I, I just want him to know what I'm doing. You know, God is not as concerned on this side of eternity with you knowing what he is doing as actually doing what he is doing as actually making you like Jesus Christ. It'll all be clear on the other side, but now he is committed to changing you because he said he was going to, and that's his plan. Sometimes we do know what, he is going, what he's doing. Sometimes it is an awful, painful confrontation that brings abrupt change. Sometimes it takes seven chapters to work in our hearts. Number two, the, specif the specificity, I can say that, the specificity of our tests or our pressures are designed to address the exact shortfalls in your heart that need repentance. I should say are. It's meant to address specific pressure, specific trials, address specific issues in you. It's not just a general blast. You know, when you, when you got something going on, you know, you got a stomach pain. You know, you're like, oh, I got an upset stomach. I'm going to go to the medicine cabinet. You open up the medicine cabinet. Oh, there's Ben Gay. Okay, great. Going to swig a tub of that. All right, oh, what else is this? What's this to say? Oh, joint rightus. Mm, got that. 
you know? I don't know any of those big names of medicines or I would say them. No, you take specifically what's going on with your problem. And God specifically is working on your problem by these pressures. And there are, there are jewels in the pressures and in the pain and what's your, the challenges of your life that he is addressing things going on in your heart. We saw that in the verses. Guys, throw that verse up again, please, the James 1, 2 passage. That is what the verse, th- these verses are talking about. We can see it clearly in the tests these brothers were going through of what God would work in Joseph, and he would put him in prison, and he'd hold back Simeon, and all the, the silver cup today, and all of that. It wasn't random. If you would just read it without any knowledge of what God was doing, it just seems so random. It seems so bizarre. You know, go back to your own, I'm going to hold one, but it just seems so bizarre, but it's not. It's particularly addressing selfishness and, and hatred and stuff in the brother's heart. And so it is with God. He sees what's going on wrong in your heart spiritually, and he deals specifically with pressures and tools of his chisel to deal with you, to bring you to like Christ-likeness. And with me. So having put that on the table about these brothers, I ask you about the pressures of your life right now. I, I want to ask you specifically, what are the pressures that you have been and you are dealing with, whether they be trials of any type or confrontations or things that are just not right, things that are disturbing you and bothering you? What are those and what is God trying to teach your heart? What is he trying to do? What is he trying to change in your thinking, change in your, in your heart, in understanding things of life? And what specific areas is he trying to confront, trying to address? Are you being receptive to that? Are you, are you being resistant to what he is trying to change? And, you know, most of us, when these things come, just say, you know, our prayer is get me out of it, get me out of it, get me out of it, Lord. <laughs> you know, so I don't want to be under the pressure anymore. I don't want to be the trial at all. Except like the whole New Testament is about suffering for the Christian and about the, the positive things that suffering brings and trials bring whatever. And, and God is working with his scalpel on your heart. So, so how, are you, how are you dealing with that? How are you thinking about it? How are you submitting to it? In what areas is God trying to address to bring repentance? And by your exact pressures, number three this morning. The process of repentance must address your heart beyond your will and actions. And I think if you think about this, some of you might say beyond your will. The process of repentance must address your heart beyond your will and actions. And as I pointed out, there, there were different points in the story, or in these chapters, where, where the, the brothers were feeling bad about what they did. They were feeling bad, they were feeling fear and shame and admitting guilt even in previous chapters, and verbalizing guilt, but they had not come to true repentance of change until this chapter 44. God did not see them ready to be restored to their brothers, and so he continued to put them through chapter after chapter after chapter of pressure until their heart was changed and ready to be restored. You remember that when Jesus said, um, when he talked, about sin in our lives. He didn't talk about sin out here. He talked about sin here of where it comes from, like a well of water that is springing up or maybe like a root that is going clear down into your heart. This is what needs to be addressed, and then this out here will fall in line. Jesus said this way in Matthew 15, 18, and in several places, actually. But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, And they defile the man, for out of the heart proceedeth evil thoughts and murders and uh, adulteries and fornication and theft and false witness and blasphemies. The word repentance in our New Testament is metanoia, and it means a change of mind. You know, maybe you have heard uh, repentance means a change of direction, all right? It is more base than that, more foundational, excuse me, more foundational than that, is that repentance, when God brings you to repentance, your mind changes. That's your heart, your inner man. Something has to change. A change in the inner man that always will result in a change of behavior. But it must start. You can't change your will, you can't change your behavior until your heart starts thinking differently about an area. 
until you're not thinking the same things that you used to think in that area. Let me give you, explain this a little bit more. It's easy to feel bad about sin logically. I've sat with a lot of people who haven't known Christ yet, and I ask them if they believe that they're sinners, and you know, uh, you know almost all of them, oh, of course, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, yeah. Logically, I, and they can list the sins. That, you know, that, that's not a change of mind towards your sin. That's an acknowledgement that you have done sin. It is easy to feel bad when your sin reaps pain. You know, it's the kid with his hand in the cookie jar. Does he feel bad at that moment? You better believe it. Does he feel bad about getting cookies? You better not believe that. It's that the pain has come. It's, you know, when you reap for what you sow, you're going to feel bad. It's easy, to, it's easy to sterilely say your sin is wrong, and, and with your will, you want to forsake it. You may even say that. I want to do better. I want to change. That's a, a comment of your will. It is easy to say words even of confession. Confession is not repentance. Even to say, you know, we shouldn't do this. The brothers say guilty, and then they say our iniquity. Okay, they, it's easy to say even words of confession, even to God, and, and that your heart has not changed. It's not true repentance. But none of these are a change of mind, of heart, about your sin. None of them are repentance. We think about sin sometimes as the one and done sins we commit on a daily basis. But don't realize, and what I mean by, you know, when we confess as believers, we think about our sin, Lord, forgive me my sin today. Okay, so we think about like kind of like swarms of flies that are, you know, their sins are right here, you know, and I did these things today. Please forgive me about these, these sins. We, we think about them as one and done sins on a daily basis, but don't realize that those sins have deep roots right into our hearts that have to be addressed. It's not just what swarm of flies that, w- that you'll deal with this day. The flies come from somewhere. There are, there are systemic sins that are our patterns. They reoccur because we have the same sinful mindset about that thing day after day after day. We somehow, though we would never say it, we would never answer it. If the pastor asked you a question from the pulpit, you'd never answer this way. But somehow, you approve that sin in your life because you keep doing it, reoccurring day after day after day. Though, if you're a child of God, you have been given the power of Jesus' resurrection to yield your members as instruments of God. Your heart stays the same, and so you just confess the flies and don't deal with the root of what's going on in your heart that approves that sin in your life. Repentance takes a heart change, a mind change. It takes our heart seeing something different about that sin that we've never seen before, changing our mind about, about it instead of running the same playlist of sin day after day after day. There are many ways the Lord changes our minds to deal with the, the deep root of our heart. But Psalm 119, 9 through 11, holds some really good um, doctrine on this. Throw it up, guys. The Bible says, wherewithal, it's a word how. How shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking, so we're talking about long-term, cleaning your way. By taking heed thereto, taking heed to my way, my life, my behavior, my direction, whatever, according to thy word, with my whole heart have I sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy commands. Thy word have I hid in my heart. Okay, that's not primarily talking about memorizing verses. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. This is talking about victory over sinful areas. In these verses, the matter of sin in the young man's way or life was a matter of his heart, not just of his behavior. And the solution to victory was to take heed to his heart, to his thinking, according to what God's word is, to match his thinking by God's word. And that take heed really means to guard So he was guarding, he was matching, he was looking at his own thinking and the way that he lived life and thought about particular areas and matching them to what God said he wanted, his word. And if it didn't match, you know, he he dealt with the thinking of his heart. Verse 10 says that his whole heart was seeking the Lord and God's command. The word whole heart, he, he uprooted any rebel parts of his heart, his inner thinking, his passions and desires and particular sins, his behavior, thinking, he became single-minded, his whole heart. 
That means like, I don't just serve God partially. I mean, my heart is not going just after God when we're singing 10,000 reasons. You know, it's pretty, it, it's pretty easy to be excited about the Lord when we're singing, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. What really is the question about worship from the heart is what happens on Monday. And if it's, it's wholehearted following the Lord, that my, where my conversation comes from, where my actions come from, my responses to other people come from, my heart, is it wholehearted following the Lord? Finally, he says, he hid God's word in his heart that he might not sin. This is making God's thoughts your thoughts. You know, hid here, hiding God's word is hoarding. I will hoard God's thoughts as my thoughts. Don't imagine a big tub full of God's thoughts. Imagine uh, one thought of God pairing it against one thought of yours in a particular subject, how you use your mouth. You know, how you use your ears, how you use your eyes, how you talk to people, how you deal with people, how you react to people, how you answer people, whatever. God's thoughts, I'm hoarding them to be my thoughts. Your thinking needs to change to God's thinking in order to cleanse your way. And if it doesn't, it's this swarm of flies thing. And you're going to be confessing the, the daily flies, but not dealing with, with the heart of the matter, which is you've got to change your mind about what's going on. For instance, in the book, Every Man's Battle, which is a book about pornography, it says you have to realize the filthy depravity of pornography to get the victory over it. And what it's talking about is everything of realizing the exploitation of, of mostly human tra trafficking of girls and the explo exploitation of nudity and how that is so offensive to God to the depravity of you sinning against your, perhaps your spouse, and the, the fact of you stealing, the fact of you uh, stealing from God, the fact of you marring the beauty of God's sex. Until you see that and change your mind about pornography, you will continue to, to do pornography. You have not seen the wickedness of it. Your, your mind has not changed about how depraved it is. In the very same idea of pornography, Pastor uh, John Piper teaches a similar but exact opposite thing about changing your mind. And this can apply to every sin. I'm just using pornography, okay? Uh, Piper says, to reject pornography, you need to see the beauty of Christ and the beauty of the gospel that is the picture, the object lesson of our marriage down on earth. And you have to see the beauty, the beautiful design of the intimacy of sex in marriage only. And until you get the picture of the beauty and change your mind about what that is, you may be giving yourself to foul things like pornography. And both of those things, whether it's seeing the depravity of pornography or seeing the beauty of sex and marriage and how that that's a, a picture of intimacy in the gospel, both of these are changing your mind. And that is repentance. And you know what, so much beyond pornography, whether you're talking about your attitudes, whether you're talking about your, the words that are coming out of your mouth, whether you're talking about your bitterness, whether you're talking about whatever sin areas, whatever things are not like Christ in your life, it's the same thing. You need a change of heart. You need true repentance, a mind change about that. The truth is repentance often happens over time, like our story, our hearts don't change on a dime. My heart doesn't change on a dime. When you realize that, you realize the depth of Christ's salvation isn't only forgiving one and done daily sins. It's not just the flies, the beauty, the incredibleness of what happened at the cross and the gospel. It forgives patterns and deeply rooted sins in us that take decades to bring to full repentance and victory. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm giving glory to God. Because it's not just, he, when, when Christ died for our sins, and when we confess on a daily basis, 1 John 1, 9, about the swords of fly, it's not just that God sees that those flies, he's not just forgiving those flies, but he is tolerating us, he's restoring a relationship with us, he's waiting on us until the, the roots of those things are dealt with, until he, re, he deals with the roots of these things. The truth of the matter is, that may take decades, but he's still willing to walk with us day by day. 
because he's committed to changing us. After we've come to Christ for salvation, God is patient with our sanctification and our change of heart. He's working repentance in us by all sorts of pressures and trials and opportunities and good things and painful things. And even Romans 2, verse number 4 says, the goodness of God even leads you to repentance. He may give you a BMW to deal with a bad area of your heart. Don't quote me on that. Don't pray that. Repentance is first necessary to believe on Jesus as Savior. I've mostly been talking in this message of, about to Christians, to believers, ones who have already been born again. But repentance, you know, salvation starts with repentance, faith, and grace, okay? And if you cannot take Jesus as your Savior until you change your mind about your sin and about the Savior. Until you say, I am a sinner and my sin should be damned. You know, I should be damned because of my sin. And I don't want to live after that anymore. And the only way that I can get freedom and forgiveness is by changing my mind. I am not my own savior. Being good is not my savior. Coming to this church is not my savior. Jesus is the only savior. And what he did on the cross is my salvation. It's my victory. I changed my mind about my sin. I don't want to live for that filthy sin. That takes you to hell. I want to live for Jesus. I want to follow Jesus. I trust you. I believe that you are the Savior who died for my sins and rose again three days later. You be my Savior. That's repentance. A change of mind towards your sin, towards your Savior. That's where salvation starts. In a moment. As we continue on in a Christian life, though, God is continuing to work. All of our sins are under the blood. We will never be condemned, but he's not He's not patient enough just to wait to get you to heaven. He is almost beginning to glorify you now. He is, he is making you like the image of his son. And that takes repentance in your Christian life. Change of mind towards areas of your life. Perhaps you are here today as a believer with patterns of sin in your life. Like the brothers in earlier chapters, you recognize it. Your attitude, words, impurity, whatever. Can you see the pressures the Lord has brought to your life to change your mind and heart about that sin? Are you changing the thinking of your heart that has generated the sinful patterns to God's thinking? Are you open to God changing your thinking and stop thinking the same way you've been thinking to his more beautiful way of thinking, more joyful way, so much more like thinking like Jesus? It took a lot of pressure to bring these brothers to genuine repentance, but Lord willing, we're gonna see that repentance leads to joy. Would you bow your heads and stand for a moment as we close?